Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Deb Wallace, and I'm the Executive Director of Knowledge and Library Services here at Harvard Business School. And we're just delighted to have you join us on, if you're in Boston, it's kind of clouding over, and uh, I think we're supposed to get a bit of snow. So, uh, but we're delighted that you're uh, all here. I particularly like to uh, welcome our colleagues from uh, Harvard's Graduate School of Education uh, and Gutman Library, um, who helped us get the, the word out um, about this very, very special book. Thanks to Alex and Mayan for all of your help. Um, I'd also like to welcome a number of colleagues from the University of Toronto. Um, Tom was slated to be in Toronto last spring uh, to talk about the book with the HBS Toronto um, Alumni Association, and that had to be canceled with the pandemic. So they've all, Tom, they've all been waiting patiently for you. So here, here we are, we've oh. got a contingent from Toronto uh, too. And uh, my thanks to uh, my friend and colleague, um, Carol Heiser, who helped us uh, spread the word. We also have uh, quite a stalwart following uh, from the uh, HBS uh, Boston Alumni Club, the Association of Boston, and we are just delighted to have you all here again. So if this is your first books at Baker, we hope it's not your last. And uh, we'll put the link into the, the chat of how you can stay on top of uh, all of the sessions. We usually do about one a month. And so we'd love to have you uh, continue to join us and, and become a regular. Um, but before I uh, introduce Tom and turn it over to him and just a little bit about how we're going to run the session. Tom, as you can see, is in his um, office in Morgan Hall, and uh, he's going to uh, take the first part, you know, 20 minutes or so and talk about some of the key concepts of the book. Uh, and then we're going to, I'm going to ask him a few questions. Uh, and then we're going to move into answering questions that you may have. So you can put in a question at any point in the chat. We are, unfortunately, the time probably won't allow us to get to every single question, but we'll also look for patterns in questions and ask, you know, sort of questions, a synthesis of questions, if that um, makes sense, because we want to try to um, engage with you as much as possible. Please note that we are recording the session, and uh, as soon as we have the transcript uh, of the conversation ready to go, we'll post the um, session on the Baker Library uh, Books at Baker website, so you can go back and have a look at it again, or you can share it with your colleagues. Uh, we'll also send you a link, every Everybody who's uh, registered a link to that um, where that video is and a set of the slides mm -hmm. so that so that you have that so Tom's been incredibly gracious uh, in allowing us to uh, do both the recording and share his slides so we will wrap up pretty close to 430 because if you're like me, you've been on Zoom all day, and you're um, even though this will be a, a fantastic session, about an hour is almost all we can take. So uh, we'll wrap up then, and then uh, we'll be back in touch with you in how to, to um, mm -hmm. access the, the uh, recording. So it is my, my great pleasure to introduce Tom. For many of you, uh, especially HBS alumni, um, you, Tom doesn't need an introduction, but he's a, mess, a professor of uh, management practice at Baker Foundation, a professor here at, at um, Harvard Business School. He is a beloved classroom teacher. And so we couldn't ask for a better person to talk about his passion uh, for teaching. He's taught courses on leadership development, organizational behavior, uh, managing human capital, and career transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and in both our MBA and our executive uh, education courses. His previous book, Flying Without a Net, something that I have not yet tried. Um, it was recognized by the Amazon publishing uh, group as one of the top 10 books written on leadership in this century. Tom is also a prolific case writer. Uh, if you go to his faculty page and just see the list of his research and his publications, uh, you'll see that he co-authored the infamous Rob Parsons at Mar um, Morgan Stanley, uh, which is Anybody who's uh, been at HBS uh, alumni or MBA in particular, you know this this case. Uh, it's a fantastic case. Uh, 
and he based this on uh, his work when he was at Morgan Stanley as Chief Development Officer and Managing Director of Morgan Stanley Group, Inc. So he'll be talking about that uh, experience and how that weaves into his, his thoughts about leaders as teachers and teachers as leaders. So as I said, you can learn more about um, Tom's work on his faculty page. Mariah has just put that in the chat. I urge you to have a look there. Um, we also have a link to his working knowledge articles. Uh, so that will give you a little more background. So Tom, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'd, like you to, I'd like to take you back to an experience I had about 12 years ago, as you know, I live, well, you don't know, I live in Boston and my mother was in her early eighties, mid eighties, and I'd flown back to visit her. And I would go back probably four or five times a year. And she was in a, a little community center there. And one time I was, I was listening to this wonderful story that she was telling me. She was telling me about a about um, a person that meant a lot to her that she was in love with that had passed away in World War II. And I was listening to her and I was, it was just a great story. And all of a sudden she stopped and she looked at me and she said, she says, you know, Tom, in this last hour, you've looked at your watch at least 10 times. And the silence was just like that, absolute silence between us. There was no more guilt. What she did say was, when you come to visit next time, could you keep your watch off? Just leave it in the car. That's the first question. That's the first story. The second story that we'll, I'll connect with uh, <clears throat> the story about my mom a little bit later. It's about a student, and I'll call him Ranjeev. And Ranjeev came uh, up to my, uh, I was teaching leadership and organizational behavior. It was busy at the end of the class, and he came up, and I, did, I thought I taught terribly. And I also saw there's another faculty member that wanted to come in and get the boards all set, and I was frustrated. And he kept um, kind of just getting too close to me. And I snapped at him, something to the effect of make an appointment or something to, to communicate that I didn't have time for him. Now, why I care about teaching and why I care about human connection is that I think that all interactions are sacred. And that's the premise with this book and the premise, the theory behind why, what I attempt to do in the classroom. And I believe that what we do in Aldrich Hall uh, here on campus is uh, in those classes, it's um, hallowed ground. So the question is, is why would I allow uh, Tom to be focused on the future or the past and not be all present, 100% present, if I actually believe that human interactions are sacred. So what I thought I'd do is, is that every, everything I do in the classroom for, that, for the 80 minute, an 80 minute class period, or a course with 30 sessions, each of them 80 minutes long, they're all based on this notion of this, the power of the human connection. And what I can do and the kind of person I can be so that that student can learn as much as she possibly can learn and also have an experience. So what I'd like you to do before I give you this framework, I'd like each one of you, if you would, is to recall a time or maybe recall the, the face of a teacher who made a significant difference in your life, a teacher that after you left the classroom, you may have even felt different about yourself, positively. It might have been three or four years after that teacher that you went, oh my, 
I realized that I, I learned how to be at my best or be my best self with being with that teacher. So I'd like you to just put down the initials or, or write the name of the person very kind of somewhere and maybe two or three of those attributes, two or three of those attributes. While you do that, where I'm gonna put up a slide, uh, Mariah's gonna help me with a slide that is, that is, is, is in the back of my head as I, uh, let's go, we'll go to the next one, um, that I'm thinking about all the time. What I care about is, is, is how am I gonna create a covenantal relationship with students? Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when they show up, and the minute class begins, they are all in with head, heart, and soul. And I also know that their heads and hearts could be in very, very different places. There could have been a death in the family. Someone might have fallen out of love or in love. Someone might be hung over. Interestingly, uh, and I'm not going to read much from the from the, the uh, book, but what I did is I asked a few students to to track their mind chatter, their internal voice, as they came into a class. This was a course on uh, being an authentic leader, and listen to some of the things were that were kind of. I've taken one particular student. This is what she's thinking about. This is at 45 seconds before class begins. I'll go in through the back entrance today. That way I can avoid making eye contact with Emily. It's not that I dislike her. It just feels awkward that we share dinner together at least once a week last year. And this year we've spoken just twice. Ever since Emily's internship in the fashion industry last summer, she mostly hangs out with the rich kids group. She's not a bad person. The most down to earth of that crew it's just that I'd rather not run into her. That's at 40 seconds. I'm gonna skip uh, to 20 seconds. How selfish can I be? I'm thinking about my evening plans tonight when I still haven't called grandpa since he had a minor stroke last week. Dad's been reminding me every day. I wonder if, it all, if all the other grandkids have called and if he thinks I don't care about him. Too busy at HBS for family? How typical. Call grandpa. I type it into my phone before hastily turning it off. Now I could go on, but mind you, there are 90 students who have internal dialogues going. And one of the things I attempt to do through uh, when I start teaching through a story is to begin getting them all in the room together where they can experience the same breath. And then we can begin this adventure together. And so my goal is, is to create a covenantal relationship with them. How do I attempt to do this? And the, 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 the research on teaching as well as about leadership uh, relates with what I'm gonna talk about. So let's go to the first thing that I wanna list. These are the three dimensions if we're interested in having our subordinates, if you're leaders, <clears throat> have covenantal relationships, or if we're teachers to have our students. One is, is, how am I building faith in the teacher? Do I have faith in the teacher? And we'll talk later when Deb's interviewing me, we'll talk a little bit about uh, that dimension. The second piece is, is how has that person how has that teacher communicated that he cares or she cares deeply about me and my work? We know that since 1990, at least in the business world, nothing has been taken off the plate of leaders slash managers. It's only been additive. And so now it's so unrealistic what we expect. And sometimes we have those same unrealistic expectations from our teachers. So how am I going to communicate that? To that person and if students feel that and feel that the teach that and have faith in the teacher then the third dimension also occurs and that is the students are focused on learning and progressing 
and they're not just thinking about survival. What's also important is there's a correlation between having a covenantal relationship in your classroom and high performance. Now, high performance might mean very different things to different people based on their competencies, but they are lifted up. They are, they're, they're attempting to be, again, their best self in that context. And what also happens is you continue to have the psychological connection through that covenantal relationship. Um, you'll see this here. Now, now what happens is that with, let's go back to Sanjeev, my student, or the student that I had. So I snapped at him. I didn't go back to repair it. He was a good student, not great, but we were midway through the course. And I noticed him pulling away and going out the other door and not kind of coming towards me. And I started to read into this that something had happened. There was a disconnection. And so what emerges, what I would say, and I talked to him later about it, unfortunately, not then. I said, you basically started to show up with your head and not your heart. And that's the movement from covenant, covenant to contract. And my goal as a teacher is to, is to be the kind of teacher, know the subject, et cetera, et cetera, so that students feel a covenant with me for a, very, uh, a number of different reasons. I don't want them to simply show up with their head because if I'm trying to model what a leader could be, if I'm asking them to be future leaders, they've got to figure out ways that they are going to create covenantal relationships to enhance the organization and the individuals within it. And now, again, the last dimension here is, is that when someone has a contractual relationship and simply shows up with her or his head, then the dilemma is, is that learning starts to decrease there is a pulling back and there's a disconnection. And if that happens enough with enough people, enough of your students, then you have very different issues that you may want to deal with. So that's one of the uh, organizing premises behind what I attempt to do uh, over a semester and in my interactions with others. Now, I think it might be more interesting for me to have a conversation with Deb about it. And Deb has questions or she may ask questions about this, but I'd, I'd invite her to, to um, come in and so that we can simply have a conversation and this isn't a lecture uh, from me. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tom. You know, I, I, I know that you are um, a keen observer of organizational behavior and what it takes to be a great leader. Um, and you're an incredibly keen observer of the teaching process, what it takes to be a great teacher. And you've asked us to think about um, the most influential teachers or, or leaders uh, in our, our lives. But I, I noticed very early on in the book and actually throughout the book, you talk about Mr. Stickle, your grade seven teacher. And that still stands out to you. I would say maybe it's been a couple of years since you graduated from grade seven. Yeah, just a few. Just a few. And, just a few. And yet he still stands out, just like I can remember my kindergarten teacher, Miss Hart. Of course, doesn't everybody want a kindergarten teacher named Miss Hart? So, so tell uh, us why, what what stands out for you. One, um, Mr. Stickle knew his content, mm. and in the in our conversations about history. Again, I was raised in Portland, Oregon, so I was interested in Lewis and Clark. And he could take us on the trail, the Oregon Trail, and I felt like I was there. And when he talked about, about each one of the members of that group having to eat six and seven pounds of meat a day, I still, I, I still remember that, that whole notion. And then when, when, when uh, Lewis and Clark get to the Columbia River, it's the first time that we really know about voting and the women and the folks that were there to serve them, they all got equal votes to decide, are we gonna go back 
now or are we going to wait the winter in Oregon? So it's the way he told stories. The other thing is, is I found, <laughs> and if my siblings are on, they know this, is that uh, my emotions are close to my heart. And I remember uh, being made fun of uh, by some students and I began to cry and I was in seventh grade. And I remember him taking me out on the playground and those were in the good old days. <laughs> he had a beautiful, he had a beautiful, uh, uh, he always wore a beautiful brown suit, white shirt, and he smoked cigarettes. And I thought, when you're 14, you think that's really cool. And he took me out on the playground and he took me on a walk and I'll never forget the walk that he just listened. And he said it was okay to cry. Um, that's Mr. Stickle. He gave me permission uh, to be me <laughs> and not to be somebody else. The other thing you, you said, and it, the picture, like uh, all your stories and all your writing just bring conjures up such great pictures. And you said that, um, a, a teacher should be like a mad scientist who can't wait to get into the classroom to share your experience, your experiment. And I'm thinking of back to the future, you know, with the white hair and the, so what does your mad scientist look like? And, and what, what are you telling us to do as teachers? Here? Well, I'm saying to be so much love, is so in love with your content that there are moments you actually, uh, you forget that you're in the classroom when you're describing a particular concept uh, in organizational behavior, there's a concept around a spouse theory and the theory in use, meaning what is selling to people? <laughs> and then how are you really living? And when I begin to talk about the variance between what you're espousing and then how you're actually living, I sometimes, for, I mean, I don't really forget but students look at me and I think later they say, I didn't think anybody could be so, not crazy, but so passionate about all it is. It's a theory. It's a theory about organizational behavior and about how individuals behave. So I think that uh, I think that I need to convince students. Mm -hmm. And I've read about it with uh, Tony Athos, uh, who's now passed, and Jack Gabarro and Lynn Schlesinger used to, say, used, used to tell me, you better convince the students that you are in love with your content, the subject, and you're in love with the students, in love with the students. So that's part of my, um, my mad scientist. Yeah. You, you also talk um, a lot about, and you're very introspective, you're, you're constantly reflecting, you're constantly assessing, and you talked about your mind chat, the, the voices that are going on, the, the chatter that's going on. And, and you talk in the book about um, the need to understand your tendencies and habits that either serve you well or get in the way of being effective. And you know, we our, our last books at Baker uh, for the people who are here was with Joe Badaracco and his book on reflection. So what you're you're talking a lot about? We're, I'm hearing more and more about taking the time to reflect and to be mm -hmm. self-aware, and then how you can use those patterns. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? So, I don't know when I began to observe this, but I start to re started to realize that I either have a great day or a terrible day. Mm -hmm. Or if I read some evaluations or uh, that say that I, that my humor, a few students will say, Professor Long, I'm a little frightened of your humor <laughs> and I don't know how to read it. Yeah. Um, and it frightens me a little bit. Well, I can read that and depending on my mood, I can say I'm the worst teacher in the world. I mean, I'm a failure. And so the pattern that I've recognized for a long time is, is, is I think about things in either or. It's either great or it's terrible. And now when Sanjev, when I, um, when I blew him off in an offensive way, at least now I feel that way, once I realized it, then I thought, oh, that's awful. So when I walk out of a classroom, I'm typically thinking that was really, really good. Or I'm thinking it's a one. It's, ah, oh, man, I really been frustrated with that. But that's a constant pattern in my life to live my life on, on, on tens and ones instead of fours and sixes. Mm -hmm. And I think it gets in the way. 
I think it gets in the way because I expect everybody in my life at school and at home to adapt to whether I'm a 10 when I come home and I've conquered the world or one is I feel like a failure. So that's, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's one pattern. Um, I think another for me is, is that I can be very pleasant with people and uh, people ha have on occasions said that I can connect with others, but if somebody confronts me uh, or I feel fright, or if I feel like I don't have an answer, uh, I'll have a tendency to get uh, angry. And I get angry, not at, not at a one, but I'll get angry at a seven or an eight. And those patterns, by the way, show up in all parts of our lives. I mean, I'm, one of my, my oldest daughters, Sarah said, she, I says, well, did I really yell when I was, when you were growing up? And she says, well, I think most people would call it yelling. <laughs> But she said, we just figured out how to manage around it. And then she says, Dad, I wouldn't want you to be any different. But then she says, isn't it interesting that I'm telling you this when I'm 25? Mm -hmm. And I didn't tell you that when I was 15. So that's an, that's a, uh, those are two patterns that are absolutely core to me that I need to manage every day. I mean, I talk about core. I also talk about stylistic. Okay. Things like my need to, to move in classroom, walk around uh, for whatever reason. I feel like it stirs up the energy in the, in the classroom. Yeah. Um, or perhaps an over-reliance on narrative, on storytelling. That, that's something that I, I think is a stylistic issue. Yeah. You, you also bring this, uh, the parallel between um, teachers as leaders and leaders as teachers. And I, I know uh, in, the, in the room we have teachers and we have people uh, from the corporate or organizations. And we have people like me who's both a teacher and an administrator. So a teacher leader in my role. Can, there's some parallels too I see in that when you talk about curriculum planning or curriculum development, that almost sounds like strategic planning to me. And you talk about course development and is that like project planning and knowing your students, is that being an inclusive um, leader? Like, can you t talk a little bit about this, this great comparison? The first piece, and it's alarming to me, and then I'll make the connection, is that I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of CEOs and senior managers. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had more than three or four who have ever defined themselves or seen their role as teachers. Really? That's not their identity. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, I'm, and I'm suggesting that's one of the reasons that so many organizations are dysfunctional because there's something else on their mind than what am I gonna do today to teach others so they can be at their best? And so, um, Yes, um, there are some fundamental things that teachers need to do, and there's fundamental things that leaders need to do, and there's a lot of overlap. For example, uh, Paul McKinnon, a dear friend, and I have used a model on leadership for a lot of years, and we simply say there's four things you got to focus on. One is you got to set direction. Now you can call it strategy, mission, what, however, how, whatever you want to call, but you have to because humans are goal-directed, so you're gonna do that in both settings. Then you need to get commitment to it, to that direction. How are you gonna get people to buy in? And then third is you've gotta execute on it. You, you need to implement. And then the fourth piece really connects into the teaching piece because I don't think many folks have, have um, memorable positive experiences with leaders because they don't see themselves as anything but uh, the head of the ship or at the helm. And I'm suggesting that, can you imagine, see what I think, I have some letters, a few letters from students where they said, Professor Long, thank you for teaching us how to have difficult conversations. Thank you for teaching us in that, the course on human behavior, how not to delay having a negative, con putting off conversations. Well, to me, that's what great teachers 
should do to teach those students to be, when they leave, that they'll be great leaders or they'll be better leaders if they learn some, uh, some more interpersonal competence. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I could just sit here and ask you my 35 million questions. And I was telling Tom that I, I had the luxury of um, a block of time one day where I sat and I read the book from cover to cover. And that's very, very rare for me to have that amount of time. And so it, it was it was just a pleasure to interact with that book. And as I said, I could just keep going. But as you may see in chat, we have a boatload of questions and I want to make sure we get to some of those. So let me transition to some of these questions. And again, some will be kind of verbatim, others will be um, a synthesis that we're, we've been putting together as we're looking through these incredible questions from Africa and from Hawaii and from all over all over the world. It's really quite exciting to see so many people. Uh, and so first, and here we are on Zoom, is how do you keep in touch with students' hearts in this remote learning environment? Okay. How, have things okay. changed for you there? First call <laughs> I made when our school shut down being in person was a counselor. Uh -huh. And I said, I think I need to retire. This was last March. I just come out of an executive program where I, where I taught with a, a gifted teacher, Scott Snook. And I called my therapist and I said, well, I think I need to retire because I've just lost my superpower. She goes, what are you talking about? And I says, I've got to teach over Zoom. And one of the things I, at least I've been told is that I can connect with people and I can create a particular spirit and I can't do that anymore. And she said, you're out of your mind. She says, you haven't even taught off over Zoom. Give it a shot. Yeah. So I've been giving it a shot. And I think you can connect. And I think the literature on those, in, for therapists, for example, who report that they've learned a lot about the ther a therapeutic model over Zoom, where they can, in fact, make more progress in certain situations with their clients. And so I think I can say, no, it doesn't work. The other thing I can do is I can perhaps tell more stories, ask more questions, but there's some things I think that we can do to connect uh, over Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have um, a manager at a global advertising agency that has uh -oh. had three rounds of layoffs and is about to go into a fourth. So this person is asking, how do I keep my covenant relationship with people when they are scared of being the next to let go? Well, this is, this, I'm just uh, reflecting on the person who sent this in. Yeah. A person that doesn't have a covenantal relationship, wouldn't send this thing in. What I mean is, is that this person has built up emotional capital. Uh, fear is one thing, anger is another. And I believe that if this person has a covenantal relationship, that people will give him or her benefit of the doubt. And I would just say, keep connecting, keep connecting, pull the people closer to you, have more Zoom calls, focus on proximity. Maybe you increase the, the, um, the amount that you are communicating with these individuals. Um, but I don't think that those subordinates at the end of the day are blaming this uh, particular manager. Yeah. And I think this manager who asked the question has to have more faith in, in the ties that he's created with these uh, managers or with his subordinates. Yeah. Here's another one. How, how can teachers think about being vulnerable with their students to deepen the relationship while still maintaining their role as an authoritative figure? Oh. 
Um, I, I guess it depends on what we we're talking about in terms of vulnerability. Uh, if vulnerability means, for me, mature vulnerability means is saying things in class like, I don't know. Or to say, you know, I don't know how to handle this situation. Or this is the first time I've ever heard that question. What do you think? Uh, I don't think vulnerability means groveling. I don't think it means sharing uh, too much information. But what I do believe is that um, is that I think we always err on the side of thinking that we need to have an authoritarian relationship. Mm -hmm. You already do. The question is, do you need that to be an effective teacher? In other words, are you talking to your students or are you talking with your students? Uh, are your students frightened of you? Is, do you want that? Uh, you, you just need to s decide in terms of your style, how much of that authority figure piece dimension you need. And I just think you may, I would invite you to step back and say, what does it mean to you to be authoritarian and also to be vulnerable? It does not mean to share everything about who you are, but it is to communicate and be dead honest that, um, that you're real, that you're real. Yeah. Here's, here's a related question, I think, is um, also around, it's around performance issues. So you, you were, you've done a lot of work in talent management, you, you do a lot of student assessment, et cetera. So um, how do you deal with performance issues during COVID, especially when people have suffered bereavement and still have to deal with business, and I think you could say learning pressures. So how, how is this time impacting how we think about progress? Well, I think it also, <clears throat> it depends on the nature of the performance. Is if, if it's a serious problem, uh, is it a um, where someone's had inappropriate uh, done things that they shouldn't do? Is it that the person is simply not um, <clears throat> performing at a certain level? Um, I just think again, I'm going to go back to this notion of prox proximity and frequency, mm -hmm. and that is you just you get in with the person and have conversation about one what what can I do. Or you ask the question, when are you at your best and how can I help you be there? And how has the organization let you down? And if we were to work closely together for the next two months, now, I would say that at the tail end of a conversation, if I know there's been bereavement, <laughs> Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But, but I'll, I should know, if I have a covenantal relationship with them, I'm going to know that. I'm not going to start with there. I'm going to just say, uh, I'm going to just uh, be as empathic as I can possibly be. And part of that would be just to be with that person. And you don't have to say a thing. Sometimes silence is about the most intimate thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And you can clearly do that, and I use it all the time over Zoom. Yeah. You have some uh, tips about instilling confidence in a room of 80 or more people. So not at just at a one-on-one -on -one level, but at a large group level. Well, I mean, <laughs> Uh, a lot of you uh, don't need to hear uh, about the Harvard Business School, at least where I work now. The first year is completely socialistic. All 900 students take the take, uh, study all the same uh, work. So there's this foundation. The second year is uh, <clears throat> all uh, it's market capitalism and you can sign up for whatever you wish. But I believe that that first year is also to teach courage. 
And we want our students to be able to start forming opinions. And they aren't gonna do that if they, if they feel like the environment isn't safe. Mm -hmm. So we keep using this, this notion of create a safe but uncomfortable setting where you're gonna spend part of that time trying to make sense of this particular situation and what, this is, what is facing this manager. And then you're gonna use another part of the class making some choices. All I know is, is that I want it from the first day, I want them to know by eye contact, mm -hmm. by a smile, that I'm there with them, regardless of their, their uh, content, or regardless of whatever they respond to. I'm gonna be there, I'm not leaving them. I am not gonna leave them uh, and leave them to be embarrassed. I think one of the greatest evils, quite frankly, in organizations or in human interactions is when you make another person feel less than, mm -hmm. where in some form, some way, you shame another person. And, and I find, I think that that's serious stuff. That's serious stuff. And uh, which, which also takes me back to the story about my mom. And that is, is if I'm actually in the present and I'm not thinking about my ego and I'm not thinking about the future or how I look to the, the students or whether they, um, whether they're invested in the course, I want them to know that whatever they do, I'm gonna be there with them. Um, I'm seeing a number of questions here where people are really interested in your creative process. So in my, in my- In your creative process or from our Canadian friends, your creative process. Mm -hmm. So how, how, <laughs> how, where, where do you get your ideas from? How do you take these ideas and turn them into story, into cases? Uh, what leads your research? Well, the first thing is, is that uh, I try to observe as many teachers as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you can, you can be creative alone, um, but then I have to experiment. You know, years, uh, oh, 2000, 12 or so when I was asked to teach the authentic leader course people were writing reflections and I thought oh wouldn't that be great if we actually read them <laughs> yeah. would we can we do that oh man if you have a hundred students can you read reflections every week but then you have to try it okay uh, my creative process is uh, on the treadmill um, it's in the middle of the night it's keeping a notepad and then the question is, is when I write it down, I always ask myself, how would I do this? Uh, I, I talk to my colleagues. I have the best colleagues in the world. Mm -hmm. And I talk to them and say, what do you think about that? Is this a crazy idea? What happens if we role play and we do that? Um, but, but I think the creative process for me is, is that if I'm not feeling uncomfortable, even thinking about it, then I don't know how much of a stretch it is. So I say to myself, and I will after the session is over, did I say too much? Uh, was I over the line? Uh, did I ever feel like I kind of I kind of um, was out of my comfort zone? And if I if I don't feel, if I say no to all those, then I haven't stretched it enough in these conversations with us. So I just say, uh, I'm in the twilight of my career and I got to go for it. And in that process, that's where there's a bunch of learning that takes place along the way. Yeah. There's, there's another question about this connection between um, uh, teaching and leadership that I, I think it will hit on a whole bunch of things that, that are uh, in the book. Um, could you please comment on the role you've seen be between development of both of these in terms of organizational culture? So the development of teaching and learning uh, in what's the role of culture? What 
role has culture played in supporting your development and how does your work as a teacher and leader support the culture of the organization? First of all, uh, if I don't have people around me that I, uh, if I don't love them, um, then there's going to be an issue. If I don't have covenantal relationships with my colleagues, then there's going to be an issue. And the research is very clear that when people are older, when they reflect back on their organizational experiences or their faculty experiences, mm -hmm. it's about the number of people that they felt connected to. And so the question is, is that is it permissible in your organization to form those kinds of relationships? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the questions. The other question is, is um, I mean, I have students ask all the time, if I go to a particular organization, I know that I can't be myself for at least 15 years. Well, then I'm, I'm delighted that they're self-aware around that. But the question then is, is that what kind of an environment has a leader created where they don't believe that the leader actually create, cares about the development? Mm -hmm. See, th this is my frustration with leaders. Is I don't think they actually listen. I don't think, I think they manage their images more than they do their essence. Yeah, there's always exceptions, but in general, they're managing their lifestyle and not when they ask the question, how are you? And how can I help? I'm not convinced that they're really listening. I think they're more interested in what's that person going to think of me if I ask these questions. The reason I believe that leaders don't see themselves as teachers is that it takes time to stop and actually show interest in another human being. It slows everything down. I clearly didn't want to slow down much when I'm with my mom. But that's the way the connection piece happens. And that's, you know, you'll know very quickly uh, when you walk into an organization, whether they actually support the developmental dimension within that organization, uh, whether, it's an, in, whether it's a university, wherever it might be. Well, I, I know like me, the participants have a ton of questions, but I also want to give you the opportunity to come back uh, and talk to us about how doing your, your story. So, so let's, let's go back to you. And then if we have more time, okay. we'll, we'll keep going, but I don't, I don't want to miss out on this piece. No. Uh, I'm going to ship to you folks, some questions, some reflection questions. Um, and Mariah, Mariah, could you actually put those, there's a few questions that I wanted to share with you that I think that, that we all kind of need to wrestle with. The first one, when I'm in front of, front of a class, I, I ask at least three times during that time, whose needs am I meeting right now? Am I focused on the teacher or focused on the students or am I focused on my image? Second. Am I honoring the dreams of the student or am I simply attempting to get through this experience? What are the dreams of the students? And how can I do that? Thankfully, I get to teach in the realm of the, the human side of the enterprise. But I am interested in what their dreams are and how I can assist in that process or at least help redirect what those dreams might be. Third, have I touched the foundations of learning theory? I think that if you really, if you study learning theory and our, our colleagues from at the Graduate School of Education will know much more about this, but I think basically humans learn uh, by gaining new content in their world. Second, they also have their assumptions questioned. And third, they learn something about themselves. So in an 80 minute class period, I attempt to, to touch on all of those dimensions of learning theory. And then the fourth question is, have I focused on image management more than essence management? 
Have I focused more on how they think uh, I am rather than focusing on them? I do believe that one of the concerns I have about our current society and our current organizations is that I think we need to be getting in the, up in the morning and rather than Tom saying, what do I need to do to honor my dreams that I consider asking the question, today, how am I gonna honor the dreams of my students? Today, how am I gonna honor the dreams of my significant other? Not just happy talk, or how do I honor the dreams of my colleagues, younger faculty? Now, I'm proud of this. Uh, I'm, finally, I'm gonna read a quick letter. This is a letter written to me by, one, uh, by a student that she, she might be one of the finest engineers I've ever, I've ever met, really gifted. You asked me about uh, what I try to do in a classroom and part of it is courage. And it, part of it is, uh, is to give them some specific tools. And this is after a number of sessions on how to have real conversations. This is what she wrote me. One year ago, my former significant other gave me an ultimatum. Say yes to his proposal or end our relationship. I chose to end our relationship. Someone once asked me when I knew he wasn't the one. If I'm being honest, and it's taking me a, over a year to admit this to myself, I knew three years into the relationship, I knew that we had very different visions of the future, but day to day, we were very compatible. I made excuses, the timing was never right. I didn't know what to say. I was afraid of losing friends, but ultimately it was my fear of disappointing and hurting him. And the next thing I knew, it had been three more years and the conversation still wasn't any easier and I certainly didn't hurt him any less. Thank you, Professor DeLong for giving me the courage to have that conversation and to realize that most of the fears were inside of me. Thank you. Now, uh, it doesn't always end that way. This one I'm really proud of, but I feel in this sense, I've honored the dreams of this particular person. And um, that's my goal, is to create an environment and a spirit in the classroom where I honor the students with high expectations, with the spirit where we are communicating with one another and making a difference in the lives of every member of that classroom. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think everybody will agree with me that you did um, touch our hearts and our heads uh, in this session. Um, talking about the power of the human connection, I don't think there's anybody who goes into teaching uh, or who lasts in teaching who doesn't hold that as absolutely the, the holy grail of connecting with students. Um, I also wanted to, in my thanks, just pull out one of the quotes because you, you alluded to this earlier that you, you talk with your, your colleagues all the time and it was something that was fairly prominent was something that um, or it st stuck home, struck home to me was uh, a comment from Josh Kogel with uh, life begins on the edge of our comfort comfort zone. Yeah, that's right. And I think you've done that today. You've pushed our comfort zone to think about uh, our connections, our aspirations, uh, both as leaders um, and as teachers. So thank you for that. Thank you, Deb. Thanks for all those who, who have attended, but, but it's the support team that's been here. You've been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So, and as I always say in every book set, Baker, Baker uh, it takes a village and this one is, is no exception. Um, what many of you probably don't know is we had a warning about uh, half an hour before this session started that our uh, Zoom was unstable and could go out at any time. And we were like, oh no, no, what would we do? Uh, so we've had a fantastic uh, team from uh, HBSIT that uh, is, has been there with us every step of the way and has been with us on all of these sessions, but today even more. 
uh, I wanted to thank Nick Wong and Brian Sullivan because they, they're just the best. Uh, Ashley Wheeler and Hensley Carrasco um, in our marketing communications, they're the ones who will put together the video for us. They've been doing social media, et cetera, and uh, we're incredibly appreciative. And from, from my team, uh, Dina Gerdeman and Mariah Tumbleson Shaw, who just like, they make the magic work. So uh, I can't, can't thank you enough for all of your help. Um, our next book set, Baker, is with Frank Cespedes. And Frank has written a really uh, fascinating book called Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. So um, we're going to break with um, uh, this, this mode or, or this format. And we're going to be joined by um, our head of marketing and sales for executive education here at HBS, um, Greg Mastouris who is in the middle of this, if you think about uh, working in this changing world as our whole model around exec ed changes. So Greg is gonna lead those conversations. Tom, did you wanna talk a little bit about the letter you were thinking about having people write? Oh, am yeah. I putting you on the spot? No, because, it's just, no, this is great. This is no, great. and, and like, the reason uh, I'm uh, the reason I'm doing that yeah. is because it's how you ended your session uh, at dialogue. That's right. And it was one of the most powerful moments I've ever experienced. So if you could take a few Deb, minutes to do you. that. Deb, thank you, Deb. Would you do that? I would. Okay. Um, I think that, and there's been so much written about gratitude, expressing gratitude. Uh, I think particularly for high need for achievement personalities, we simply think that people already know that. And so uh, during a, a conference, I asked folks to write a letter to a, the person that they had an, an image of. And so Deb is nudging me to invite you and thank you, Deb. I'd like you to consider writing a letter to the person that you wrote down. If the person has passed, that's just fine. Write it anyway. You might even send it to a close friend who can be a surrogate. I think that we all had the opportunity tonight or today, this morning, to be together. And there were teachers that played a role in us being here. It wasn't just on our own merit. And uh, I would just like to invite you to uh, write them a note. And if you really want to do something exciting, uh, call them and read it to them uh, so they can hear it uh, from your voice. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We're so glad you could join us. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Books at Baker. Don't forget to just keep um, checking our website where all the um, information is held. It will be on February 25th, this same time, uh, 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern. And uh, I can certainly guarantee you another fascinating session. Thank you, Tom, as always. Thank Just you. love seeing you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>